Good morning. When Pastor Brian asked me to share the message for today, I thought I'd check with the experts and see what they had to say about uh, the uh, laity Sunday. So, according to Google, the basic definition of laity is the non-clergy members of a church. Laity Sunday was established by the General Conference to be observed the third Sunday in October to focus on the ministry of all Christians. Many churches do so by having lay members lead parts of the worship service on that Sunday. Some fight the nerves and are willing to publicly lead parts of the worship on that Sunday and on other Sundays when asked. Others do so more quietly on an ongoing basis, behind the scenes. One thing is for certain, the church can't survive without an active membership. I think we've all heard the saying that it takes a village to raise a child. What that says to me is that it takes many more people than just the parents to create a successful and worthwhile adult human being. Likewise, it takes more than our pastored and salaried staff to maintain and create a successful and worthwhile home church. Over 20 years ago, I had recently gone on a three-day religious retreat called the Walk to Emmaus. Our pastor at the time, Boyd Etter, asked me to organize a ministry at Salem called Shepherding that had been successful at some of his previous churches. This was an organization of our congregation into small groups of family members led by a volunteer shepherd. The duties of the shepherd were to keep in touch with their flock, helping them in times of illness and family death, sharing prayer requests, checking them with, with them if they missed several services. The organized program eventually did fade away but the spirit of the program is still alive and well. The literature provided explaining how to organize the program and to get it started <coughs> stated over and over again that the pastors can't do it all by themselves. If you look at a successful megachurch of today, congregations of a thousand or more members, one fairly common thread is the presence of family groups. These churches may have four or more ordained ministers and huge paid staffs, but it takes volunteer laity led by small, to lead small groups that meet routinely, in addition to multiple weekly services led by staff to help them survive. Some may say that the laity of the church is the body of Christ of the church. I think there's a slight difference. To me, the body of Christ is the entire congregation including the pastor and paid staff, while the laity is composed of two groups. One group is those members who agree to do more than attend services. The other is those who faithfully come to worship. Both groups are important. Like scripture says over and over again, the entire body is important, no one part more significant than another. If those who simply attend worship stop coming, the rest of the congregation may not be a large enough group to support the church. If there are too few laity who volunteer to assist in the operation of the church, those who simply attend may look for another church. So yes, just like the human body <coughs> requires multiple parts working together to keep it alive, the church requires multiple types of participation to keep it alive. <coughs> Reflecting on the Bible's use of the intricate inter-involvement of simple and complex activity to make our body work, to explain how our church should function, I can't comprehend how anyone can seriously look at the functions of the human body and the similar interactivity of nature and deny the existence of an omnipotent creator. As a simple illustration, Earlier this year, Pastor Brian was talking about the several large trash piles that are found in the Great Lakes and our oceans. Winds and currents take the unavoidable and intentional debris that gets into our large bodies of water and guides it to one of several locations, making it easier to get rid of it, if we want to. Thank you, God, for giving us this beautiful place to live and a way to help us to keep it beautiful. God created our world and us to live in it and gave us the freedom to use his gifts and enjoy life or abuse his gifts and suffer the consequences. The need for laity in the church is nothing new. Going back to the organization of the Jewish faith found in the Old Testament, 
in Exodus 18, verses 13 through 26, and Deuteronomy 1, verses 9 through 18, we find one example. Moses is so consumed by trying to run things and rule on issues that he is spending his whole day doing nothing else. His father-in-law suggests that he appoint others to hear the more trivial cases. So he tells God that he needs to have assistant leaders to help him rule on disputes and keep the religion alive. God said, good idea. So Moses appointed a system of judges to rule over groups of 10, with more qualified people organized in a tiered structure to help all of the judges rule fairly, leaving Jesus to attend to the more severe and complicated issues. The New Testament has multiple examples of laity assisting in running this new religion. A few of those would be the appointing of the 12 by Jesus, the selection of the Jerusalem Council to assist the 12 when the decision-making became more than they had the time to deal with, the appointing of many to go and spread the good news. In Romans 10, verses 13 to 15, one of my favorite passages in the Bible, we find these words, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How can they call on the one they've not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It doesn't say, and how can they hear without a minister preaching to them? It says without someone preaching to them. You can be that someone. It can be your feet that bring that beautiful news about salvation through Christ. Our scripture readings found in the liturgy for today are from the Old Testament, Job 38, verses 1 through 7, and from the Gospels, Mark 10, verses 35 through 45. In Job, we find these words. Then the Lord answered Job out of the storm. He said, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? Brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring line across it? On what were its footing set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. At some point in time, the concept developed that believing in God and following his guidance led to a perfect life without conflict. Maybe that came in part from God promising a land of milk and honey when the Israelites did make it to the promised land. But we are repeatedly reminded in the Old Testament beginning with Adam and Eve, that human beings don't do what they are told, especially by God. And because of that, life is not all peaches and cream. The book of Job is evidence to that fact. Some religious historians believe that, the, that Job was the first book of the Bible to be written down. An ancient attempt at explaining why do bad things happen to good people was possibly the first words written that became society's guide for living. The first 37 out of 42 chapters of Job tell us what a good and righteous man he was, what calamities repeatedly fell on him, and his friends' attempts to answer why. Finally, in chapter 38, God begins to answer Job out of a storm. He didn't answer Job's questions directly, Instead, he pointed out Job, like all humans, was completely ignorant of the significance of the natural order of God's creation, the universe. So how could Job, or any of us, possibly understand God's mind and character? Our only option is to submit to God's authority, no matter what life is giving us, and rest in his care. I have repeatedly said and firmly believe that a life in Christ is not perfect without conflict, but it is better because we have Christ to share with us during the good times and to carry us during the tough times. In the New Testament is from Mark chapter 10, verses 35 through 45. 
Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. <coughs> Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you, instead, Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The words of our Lord and Savior. Mark records that James and John went directly to Jesus with their request, while Matthew says that they made the request through their mother. Either way, it is clear that they expected places of honor in Jesus' kingdom because of what they were doing as part of his laity. Most Jews at the time, including the disciples, believed that the Messiah's kingdom, promised in the Old Testament, would be an earthly kingdom that would free them from the oppression from Rome. When the other disciples heard of James and John's request, they became indignant not because they realized that Jesus' kingdom was not an earthly one, but because they too probably wanted places of authority and possible wealth when Jesus did invade and take over Rome. God intended for the Messiah's kingdom to not be centered in palaces and thrones, but to be centered in the hearts and souls of his followers. The disciples did not begin to realize this until after Jesus' resurrection. Jesus, knowing full well what he would face, asks James and John, do you really want to be on my left and right and face what I will endure? They said they were willing to face any trial for Christ. And unlike Peter, scripture never mentions them denying their relationship to Christ when faced with persecution for knowing Christ. James was eventually executed as a martyr. The other nine were also executed some by crucifixion, and John died of old age in exile on an island. It's easy to say that we would endure anything for Christ, but in reality, how many of us would say yes, like the girl at Columbine when asked, are you a Christian, knowing that we would be shot and killed because of our yes? Most of us complain over the most minor problems and situations that don't go our way. Serving Christ means serving others in some fashion, and at times that service can involve irritations and possible persecution. Jesus didn't ridicule James and John for their request. He simply denied it. As a follower of Christ, we are free to ask God for anything that we want, but our request may be denied. He denies some requests because he alone knows what is best for us. Jesus tells James and John that whoever wants to become great among their peers must be willing to be their servant. Most businesses, organizations, and politicians measure greatness by high personal achievement and dominance over others. In Christ's kingdom, service is the way to get ahead. Rather than just seeking to have your needs met, <clears throat> also look for ways you can minister to the needs of others. According to Mark, Jesus tells the disciples that he came into the world not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. In Jesus' day, a ransom was the price paid to release a slave. Jesus paid the ransom for us to free us from a life of sin because we cannot, a life of slavery to a life in sin, because we cannot pay it ourselves. As I said before, 
The disciples, along with the rest of the Jews at that time, thought that Jesus' life and power would free them from Rome, in comparison of relatively minor slavery. In reality, Jesus' death would save us all from the even greater slavery, a life in sin. Willingly accept his gift and use it for the benefit of those around you. In closing, I will share with you, as I always do whenever I have the privilege of sharing a message, the phrase that the Holy Spirit put on my mind when I was working on my presentation the first time I was asked to be part of a spiritual team and give one of the talks on another walk to Emmaus. Share your life with Christ and make it a life that Christ would want to share with you. Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for the opportunity of being those feet who bring good news, even if it is simply by setting an example to our friends and neighbors by routine attendance to church. May the Holy Spirit guide us to be the Christian you would have us be. In Jesus' most precious name we pray, amen.